I've been going through the animated 90s X-Men cartoon that I watched religiously back in the day, and in all honesty, it is a great show. Now while it may seem dated at points, it got me thinking about the early 90s and my experience with X-Men video games. There's been plenty of side-scrolling X-Men adventures in video games. Heck, I've even reviewed a few. Some have been pretty solid, while others have been either generic or practically unplayable. Now just to point out, I am very well versed in X-Men 2 Clone Wars on the Sega Genesis. It's a phenomenal X-Men game and a great Sega Genesis title. But if we're talking about 16-bit consoles, I only owned the Super NES back in the day. And because of that, there was really only one or two X-Men games that I played, and since I've reviewed one already, actually technically two, we're going to be talking about the third, and that game is X-Men Mutant Apocalypse. In the 1990s, the Japanese video game developer Capcom were big fans of Marvel Comics-based franchises, specifically the X-Men. They began working with the Western comic book company when developing The Punisher, an arcade beat-em-up that also received a decent port on the Sega Genesis. Work quickly began on bringing the X-Men to the arcade in fighting game format, with the first X-Men fighting game produced by Capcom in 1994, X-Men Children of the Atom. While console ports were handled by Acclaim shortly afterwards, Capcom also released X-Men Mutant Apocalypse on the Super Nintendo during the holiday season of 1994. So, almost 25 years later, should this game receive all the ecstatic existential praise that it exudes? Or is it time for our exquisite taste in X-Men games to be exterminated? Mm, okay, maybe one too many X-related puns. I'll just let the voiceover explain. <laughs> Before the game starts, we're given a brief synopsis of who the X-Men are, and their mission to unite humans and mutants in a peaceful fashion. But on the island of Genosha, mutants are imprisoned as slaves, a stark contrast to Professor X's dream of peaceful cohabitation between humans and mutants. We learn that Apocalypse has plans for these mutants, but what could they be? I'm sure we'll find out in the game later on, right? After the title screen, Professor Xavier advises the player as if they're part of the team. We learn that the X-Men are invading the island to rescue their fellow mutants who have been enslaved. However, they're doing it by... splitting up the team? Wait, don't the X-Men typically work together on every mission? <laughs> What's with the covert ops? It's more or less an opportunity for the player to take all five playable X-Men for a test drive, with Cyclops as the Boy Scout leader, Wolverine the Lone Soldier, Beast as the brains and muscle, Gambit as the mysterious thief, and Psylocke, the hot one. I mean, don't get mad at me, they're the ones that said it. This would never fly in this day and age. I mean, sure, she's attractive, but she's also a force to be reckoned with. She's one of the most powerful ex-women around. Between her badass psychic knife, telepathy mutant powers, Along with her martial arts and primed agility, she's one tough cookie. She also has... <sighs> Matchless beauty. Okay, you win, Capcom. You win. Also, what's up with Gambit's profile? He charges with unknown energy? Hasn't it been pretty well established that it's kinetic energy? Eh, semantics, I suppose. Now I'm just being a comic book geek. Wait, I am a comic book geek! 
Moving with the directional pad makes characters go where you need them to be on a flat 2D surface. This is a side-scrolling Capcom action game at its finest, with the B button being used for jump and the Y button used for your primary attacks. However, the way this game takes influence from games like Children of the Atom involves special moves. Depending on the move list of each character, certain motion inputs with the directional pad allows heavier hitting combos and attacks. Fighting game fans will feel right at home with their quarter circle forwards, forward down forwards, forward forward attack, forward to down, and up up down down left right left right BA start. Wait, no that's not right. That's not even the right company. Quarter circle forward everything bagel toasted with chive cream cheese. Hold on, wait, no, I can get this. Down forward boiled shoe. Damn it, oh, I'm so bad at these fighting games. All joking aside, the move list is fairly straightforward and easy to master with experimentation. These special moves allow our heroes to decimate their opponents with either calculated grace or by bouncing off their heads back and forth. I initially had reserves about this type of fighting style, especially with Psylocke, as it really seems like her control inputs leave her wide open to get hit on. Oh, stop it, you know what I meant. For example, she has a move where she initiates a flying leap kick into the air, but when she lands, she's left with no defense, which can result in getting pummeled, and pummeled you will get in this game. X-Men Mutant Apocalypse Apocalypse's enemy roster is hard hitting, leaving massive damage on your life bar that will send you into extinction very quickly. Initially, each member of the team invades a separate level that's been tailor-made for their powers. Beast can hang on ledges upside down, Wolverine can climb walls with his claws, and, well, the rest just kind of make good use of their mutant and physical strengths against a heavier flow of enemies. Cyclops and Gambit are tough fighters for sure, but their mutant powers in the form of projectiles are mostly used to keep enemies at bay from a distance without necessarily always engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat. In these characters' levels, there's an overall greater focus on combat and instead of tricky platforming, like in Wolverine, Psylocke, and Beast levels. To give players a fighting chance, there are special X symbols that are spread throughout the levels that you can collect, though these can be really tough to gather in each stage. Grabbing three of these will give you another life for that specific character that you're playing as, and trust me, you're going to need them because Mutant Apocalypse provides a pretty thorough challenge. Between fighting Sentinels, Robot Mechs, guys with knives, underwater guys with knives, mobster henchmen from a Batman cartoon episode, and UPS workers, there's plenty of variety in this game to keep players on their, uh, X-toes? They can't all be gems. I'm actually really impressed with the graphics in this game. I mean, sure, X-Men 2 Clone Wars also has really detailed characters and sprites with some cool snowfall effects and whatnot, but Mutant Apocalypse just looks so clean to me. The sprites are all chunky and vibrant and really complement the comic book style of the 90s really well. The backgrounds, while well designed visually, make the levels seem small at times, mostly thanks to the larger sprite size of the characters and enemies. I can't exactly be upset with this as the characters themselves look great and absolutely match their comic book counterparts and cartoon versions with perfection-like detail. While the backgrounds are well drawn, they can at times be a bit generic and even downright confusing. Sure, forests, fortress compounds, and shipping docks make sense, and of course you gotta have an elevator level, but a wall of flowing lava underneath a prison? Level layouts make sense initially, but as the game progresses, things get a bit confusing. Starting off as one of the five X-Men, as we said before, you're invading the Genosian prison. And that makes sense, I understand that. Each character has their own level, alright, fine by me, as it kind of feels like an infiltration mission similar to something out of like Metal Gear Solid or even the first Ninja Turtles game on the NES. You really feel a part of this team despite working separately as you try to break in and locate the mutants, but once you do, the game's flow is all over the place. If you finish all five levels, you get a password, which makes me feel like these stages are more along the lines of the proving grounds of the game. If you can prove you can learn each X member and their levels and have what it takes to advance to the next part of the game, then you're worthy of continuing via passwords. We're then able to pick any team member for the same stage no matter which one you pick. The levels after the first five have specific secrets that only certain characters can access via hard to reach locations, such as climbing with Wolverine or reaching it with Beast. 
While they typically do give access to these power-ups in other parts of the stages, they're just so much easier to get with these more acrobatic characters. A perfect example is the level where you face off against the brood in the forest and the caves. I can't access these parts up top because I can't grip the wall with Gambit, but Wolverine does just fine. But later in the level, I find an icon that anybody can get, including Wolverine and Beast. In the Lava Prison level, it's kind of a similar situation. Wolverine can climb these walls to completely avoid the rest of the lava wall approaching from behind, and he can even drop back down to grab the power-up he missed at the end of that wall down below. But if someone else were to be a tad bit slow and want to grab the icon right above the lava, death. This game at times demands perfection, and while I don't really have an issue with this because I personally like difficult action games, I'd prefer the game to not favor certain playable characters, even if Wolverine is my favorite. I'm just glad that my favorite character can access these points so easily. That's cause I'm the best there is at what I do, and what I do isn't very nice, pub. <laughs> That's right, Wolverine. <laughs> Speaking of Wolverine, I absolutely love his entrance the most out of all the initial introductions to the characters. Sure, Cyclops blasting his way in, Gambit leaving a calling card that explodes, Psylocke riding some weird hover bike in, and Beast walking on the ceiling is cool, but I mean, how freaking badass can you get? He just jumps out of a window after some sick guitar riffs, shattering into pieces as sirens begin to wail and the fighting starts, and it's one of the most memorable moments in any X-Men video game ever. Hmm, but you know, I've always wondered what this game would sound like if it featured voice acting, just like in the Capcom X-Men fighting games. I go where I wanna go. Nah, that's right from the cartoon. We can do better than that. So, Chuck says the Sentinels are being made in this place. Looks like a bunch of tin cans down there. Well, might as well take out the trash. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> But how about something completely nonsensical? Someone's eating pancakes. Without syrup? Speaking of the music, Setsuo Yamamoto and sound designer Ippo Yamada knock this soundtrack out of the park. From the more organ-heavy tracks in Beast level, to Cyclops' Mega Man X-inspired power metal with dual harmony guitars, this is one of the best X-Men related video game soundtracks out there, with plenty of variety to keep you humming along while beating up the bad guys. So, after Apocalypse is defeated, you then learn that Magneto is taking over as the main bad guy, and now the pacing is just lost on me. In this game, we get the five initial levels, a forest level, a boss fight with Tusk, then Apocalypse's Lava Dungeon Orama, then two Danger Room showdowns with Fake Juggernaut and Fake Omega Red, and then a longer level before the final Magneto battle? I feel like the name of this game doesn't make sense. Sure, Apocalypse is a boss fight, but not the final boss fight. Shouldn't he be the final bad guy? I mean, it's called Mutant Apocalypse. Their narrative struggles to regain my interest in the story, but I'm still enjoying myself as I take out Omega Red and Juggernaut fairly easily. Thankfully, the final level finally gives us what we're looking for, a single level that is different with each character depending on who you pick. And they're each tailor-made for the chosen character. I feel like most of the design focus was on this last stage, as the game definitely ends on a strong note. I'm also glad that if you die trying to take on Magneto, picking the same character allows his life bar to remain where you left off before you die. This makes the game a little more forgiving. Here's the problem I have with dying in this game. If you die in the first five levels, the game is over, but afterwards you can potentially lose an X-Man for almost the entire game. Only the last level has a one-up icon that cycles through both alive and dead mutants, giving you the opportunity to bring characters like Cyclops back from the dead. Silly Cyclops. While I understand that building replayability back in the 90s involved artificially inflating difficulty, I feel like perfection is a bit too hard to muster here, especially since avoiding losing all lives on a single X character will reward players with an extended ending. There's passwords, sure, but these eliminate achieving the special ending as well. There's also a training mode, which lets players have an extra life? and still a game over in the first five stages? They really make you work for that final ending, so roll up your sleeves, pop those claws, and make it happen. X-Men Mutant Apocalypse deserves the praise it receives. 
to a point. It's generally fun with colorful characters, great graphics and music, and a unique take on the standard action platforming genre with the fighting game themed special moves and infiltration based storyline. I just wish the midsection of the game was a little better thought out regarding the mechanics and level layout so all characters could benefit. But either way, this is a fantastic X-Men game and well worth your time. I'm glad I was able to finally talk about a good X-Men game on the Super NES for a change. And while yes, most of the titles that I've reviewed in the past have been very meh, there's plenty more exciting X-Men X games existing? Okay, okay, nope, I blew it. I wanted to give a huge thank you and shout out to Cal Dodd for doing the voiceover lines for Wolverine. He is the original voiceover actor for the Fox Kids 90s X-Men cartoon. And the whole reason why Wolverine became my favorite X-Men character was thanks to this guy. So Cal, it was a pleasure meeting you and thank you again so much for taking part in this episode. Thank you to the following patrons. Your support means the world to me. Want more Dude You Haven't Played This Game? Make sure to stay subscribed to the channel and check out these videos enclosed below. As always, thanks for watching.